I'd like to do now is I'd like to introduce two very special guests. One we're going to talk to uh, in a second. Another, we're, I'm sure we can't not talk to him because he won't allow us not to talk to him. Oh, thanks, My yeah. great friend John thanks, Allen yeah. Cassidy is here tonight. Yeah. This is Dawn Hinkle, Al's daughter. And what I'd like to do now is spend a little time, and we can do it to whatever level that we want. Al, we want to get your memories, and we want to capture on film uh, some of the stories, some of which I know we've heard before. I've heard a few of them. I'm sure you've got a lot of them that I've never heard. And so for those of you who weren't here earlier and you may not know, Al was a great friend of Neil's when they were young. And then, of course, he met Jack and Alan, who Cassidy is named after over here, John Allen Cassidy. Of course, Al's known John since the day he was born, of course. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Nobody's perfect. <laughs> so, Al, tell us a little bit. If you, well, first of all, let's give a, hand, a big hand for everybody. Oh. Just oh. 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 Al, tell us a little bit about when you met Jack and what it was well, like for you. Uh, we're celebrating his birthday, and I ran around with him for a while. Uh, I must be up a pretty good age myself. Uh, <laughs> But last week I was really thinking, uh, I go to the senior center down in San Jose, different senior centers, to play bridge. That's uh, one of my passions, uh, playing bridge. And uh, play with like three different groups, different uh, senior centers. But there's actually four people that I can think of offhand that are over 90 years old. And they're sharp as a tack. In fact, one of the good, really good bridge players there is 96. He could remember every card, make every finesse, uh, remember the bidding from, you know. He's a great bridge player. And this takes a little brain power. And what I was thinking that there, has a, there was a couple of French writers, uh, some of those scholars here would probably be able to tell me. It was either Balzac or Voltaire that published over 90 volumes. Anybody remember? No. 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 We're not looking no. like no. I'm no. 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 We hear crickets. Got thinking, crickets. <laughs> Jack was such a prolific writer. Uh, like, like, the, like the book Maggie Cassidy, which might not have been one of his greatest books, but he knocks it out in like two months down in Mexico City or something. Uh, had Jack had a little better immune system <laughs> and had been able to stay away from the alcohol, uh, of course, now, one thing is Jack had this thrombosis that he had a lot of pain in his legs. And in the beginning, he did a lot of drinking to cover up the pain. And uh, uh, I've been very fortunate. I've been out of pain, but except for the last a little, little late in my life, I had a little bit of pain. But I've been really fortunate that way all through my life. But I was thinking, you know, that if Jack, you know, why couldn't he be in the life today? And with, he had a lot to say that he didn't get set. Uh, I, I know he wanted to write considerably more about the, the French Canadians and, and their influence in, in, um, uh, in the um, New England area. Uh, he had a whole kind of in his mind, uh, four or five books in his mind that he wanted to get going on and and never made it but you know he, he had he had a good 90 books in him you know it's just kind of a shame yeah and uh, um, because with modern medicine they kept me alive <laughs> somehow and uh, yeah it's just too bad now can I ask of course Neil's a separate case because he was just Burning that candle too heavy at both ends. And you think? I couldn't. Yeah. <laughs> I couldn't save him all the time. You know, it was uh, too much for me. 
<laughs> in fact, he was he was too much for this world. Right? Yes, bravo. Uh, but uh, Al, let me ask you a question. If I yes. Can. And and by the way, young guys, if you want to come around here and sit on the floor, maybe pull up a little bit. If anybody wants to, we got plenty of room over here. Um, Al, let me ask you a question. Interesting over here. I uh, I've often wondered, was it because Jack became the king of the beatniks? Was it because he was being blamed for everything that was going on in the world that he reached this point that he literally had to bury himself in the bottom? Did you see that? Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah, he actually kind of, he really, you know, turned away from, well, he never was into hard drugs. And uh, later he, he thought some of his influence might have turned people into hard, you know, to using, experimenting with hard drugs because he wrote about it. Because he wrote about it. And he felt a little guilty about this. And, um, we had, you know, a couple of conversations about this because I never did get into hard drugs either. You know, I smoked my share of pot. I had uh, uh, my share of um, uh, old, old-fashioned uh, benzene inhalers, which is <laughs> those were the hot items. The ones right? they had to take out of the Yeah, you had to. Had to pull them apart and then <laughs> take this cotton and swallow it, and but boy, it would it would it would it would keep you up for 24 hours. Um, it was a high, <laughs> but uh, a parent wasn't uh, addicted, you know, because when I quit, I quit, you know. And so that's not what I heard. <laughs> <laughs> just kidding, Al. Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> but but Jack suffered guilt over that. Is that what yeah, you're saying? Yeah, he did. You know, it's interesting. Carolyn was here one night. I don't think you were here that night, but she was on stage, and there was a guy in the back, and then we came to a question and answer part, and he basically said, you know, you people ruined my life. It's because of you that I got into this and I did that. And he really, literally blamed Carolyn for Weiner. him having issues in his life. And it was interesting to hear people kind of shout him down, but everybody says, you know, what about personal responsibility? I mean, you know, can't you take care of yourself? But but Jack did suffer the guilt because he spread the message. Yeah, I just, well, you know, I, I I don't want to to get into uh, into religion, you know, but Catholicism does. You know, if you don't go to confession, you know, you carry your guilt, and, and uh, um, so and and Jack was a he had that training. Yeah, sure. You don't need any. He uh, he liked he liked the Buddhists too, right? You know, and, and he, um, uh, but he, he did have that that that, that feeling that uh, some of this might have been carried away a little bit. How about we talk about something happier? How about you tell us the first time you met Jack? Oh well, I, I, my, my first really memories was in going up. On Christmas Day, um, breaking in on a, on a family's Christmas dinner in North Carolina. Really? That was the first time you met him? Yep. Yeah. Did that when you were on the road? That was on the road? I, I, yeah. I, have, I had a vague memory of, of, of seeing him in Denver, but I can't bring it to the fore, you know. Um, but I remember that day really well. And, um, gee, they just, they just, Welcome to see. You couldn't, couldn't believe the welcome we got, you know, and had to sit down and have to have dinner. And these are a bunch of people from the West Coast, and we must have looked terrible. We had driven all the way from from California, and one stop in Denver for a shower, and then I think the rest of the way it was right to North Carolina, and uh, we must have looked pretty ratty, I guess. For those of you who don't know, that is basically uh, a story from On the Road. Uh, in On the Road, Neil and Lou Ann Henderson, Mary Lou, as Jack calls her in the book, and uh, Jack, of course, and Al, and uh, they all drive, well, Jack's not in the car at that point, but, but Neil and 
Lou Ann Henderson and Al and Al's wife Helen yeah. drive in the car from uh, California to the East Coast. You had just met Helen. Yeah, yeah, a couple weeks before I married her. Yeah. It's the guy that marries a woman he's known for a week. <laughs> I'm glad I've never known <laughs> And they were together until the day she passed away. What, 47 yeah, so years later? Uh, yeah, 47 years. But, Dawn's mom. you know, I, I knew and she knew that we were, we were going to be soulmates. But, you know, we made a connection uh, which actually had nothing to do with was sex because we waited till after marriage, you know, to try it out. <laughs> uh, but, but neither one of us was working at the time, and we spent hours and hours, 14, 15, 16 hours a day together. And I, and I would say that we got to know each other and, and understand each other, and we built from that. Um, I was a little immature, uh, emotionally, I, you know, I had to, to, uh, to uh, I guess, uh, spread some wild oaks yet, but uh, she knew this, and, she, and uh, but she knew I was coming back, and she knew she would be there for and I knew she would be there for me, so, so that was fine. Yeah, what, what happened, we, we left San Francisco here, Neil and I, and uh, we get to El Paso, and he makes a 90 degree turn to head to Denver, because he says, um, he just couldn't go, to, couldn't go to New York without uh, Mary Lou, is <coughs> the name in the, in the book. So up, up to Denver we go. And we're in this Hudson, replica of the one that's downstairs. Same <coughs> here, same model, same great back seat that you can lay down in. <laughs> you have to look at that back seat when you uh, when you leave here. And uh, so that, you, can see, you, can really, you can really sleep. In <coughs> so for those of you who don't know, the car downstairs is the exact car that they used now in, in on the road. It's not the car because that car is lost to posterity. It's not the car that Neil owned. And actually, believe it or not, Al was with Neil the day he bought the 49 Hudson. And actually, Neil was a little <laughs> short of cash that day. I had to help put up another hundred bucks. <laughs> <laughs> and Al told me the way he uh, remembers it is you knew you'd never see that hundred bucks again. <laughs> no. no, but uh, we never, we never, we never uh, lend each other money. You know. Yeah, you guys were that close. I know that. <laughs> got, yeah, we long past that point. You know, if we had any money, it was a kind of shared money. And uh, but the thing is about buying that car. Uh, everything was extra. Radio was extra. Heater was extra. And we were short of cash. And if you're right on the road, you know that we got the radio. But we left out the heater. <laughs> and when we left here, it was in January. Going to El Paso was okay. But when Neil made the 90 degree turn and heads to Denver, and they were having a blizzard in Denver at the time, <laughs> and we did a little scraping of ice off the windshield as we drove across Kansas and, the, and uh, um, across the United States into Missouri and, and, and so forth. Uh, getting to North Carolina, um, but I, I, I think we made the right choice with the money we had. The radio was important. <laughs> <laughs> Who were you guys listening to? The heater we could, oh, uh, all the all the big anything that had a, a a good saxophone or a good trombone. Uh, we kind of kind of some of us kind of liked some of the big bands. Um, some of the old tunes like um, the A Train, <laughs> Sing Sing Sing, uh, uh, um, yeah, some of the big 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 bands. Um, yeah, we had that radio going 24 hours a day, no doubt about that. 
But we get to North Carolina, and, and Jack's family is, you know, treat us really well. I, I couldn't understand how they could, you know, take in all these bums and, and uh, be so nice to us. <laughs> and then we left there with, with Jack next day um, up to, up to, up to uh, their apartment in Long Island where Neil drops Luann and I off. And then he and, and Jack take right off and go right back to North Carolina to get his mother. <laughs> and a bunch of stuff to fill up the car with, the, the trunk and the back seat and so forth. Um, so they made an extra little little trick back there. And, uh, but riding in, in, the, in the car up from North Carolina with, with Jack, that was, that was quite an experience. Um, but we stopped at the all night, uh, all night diner about four o'clock in the morning and we go in there and it was just dirty dishes on all the counters and it had about four or five tables this is one of these kind of railroad diners and there was one guy working in there and he was the chief cook and bottle washer <laughs> he had two people that didn't show up and the place was a mess and we go in with almost no money, and I made the proposition to the guy, how about if we do the dishes, clean everything up, we feed us all the hot cakes and coffee we could, we could eat? And the guy jumped at it. Yeah. Of course, Luann had to do all the dishes. <laughs> <laughs> That's a girl's job. <laughs> I, it's 1949. I don't know. She just went automatically. You know, I guess this is before women's lived. She went automatically to the to the to the sink, get the soap going. And Did so Neil forth. do anything? And uh, then we started uh, bringing dishes back. And uh, but then Neil was. The guy had a radio in there, and Neil was playing with the radio most of the time, <laughs> other, uh, doing the work. But we did get the place mopped up, all the dishes done, and the guy started the hot kicks. You know. Now, I don't remember, because that memory was so vivid with me, I don't remember how, he, how Jack did it on the road, or if he even had that on the road. But, but I know when we, we we filled up with the gas the last time we filled up with gas and we saved 50 cents because the Lincoln Tunnel cost 50 cent toll at that time. We had to have 50 cents or we weren't going to make New York. <laughs> and I remember that we had to make sure we had 50 cents, which is just about what we had. Now, as I recall, when at one point you were driving the Hudson and you got pulled over by the cops. Yes, that was uh, when we, after you know, three weeks up in New York, and uh, we're, we're headed with California license plates, which at that year looked very similar to New York plates. It was the same color. And I think we were in a kind of a speed trap area, uh, because I don't think to this day I should have got stopped. <laughs> now here, imagine this, this is a, this is a freeway. You got three lanes over here. You got this gray, big meridian between us, like like a grass area, and three lanes over here with the traffic going. And over on this side, a school bus stopped. And he got the blinkers on. But I'm way over here, you know. I go by, and boy, the cop car was right there. You know, in fact, I saw the cop car, but I didn't think that would. It didn't look like a violation to me. You know, and they took me to a, a grocery store where the county judge was a clerk in the store. Or the store and he held, he held uh, judge judgment right there. You know. Pay the fine, thirty bucks, or or one week in jail. 